and welcome, beloved, to the You Have Your Bibles broadcast. We are grateful and thankful to our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for this and all privileges to come before them and you. And uh, so we thank the Lord for each one of you who will view this broadcast as we indicated last time that uh, our midweek Bible study at least during this season uh, we have uh, set that aside in favor of me coming up when my schedule permits to uh, continue in the book of Ephesians but also to bring uh, messages that uh, upon my heart to, to bring before our church family along with others who uh, may have ears to hear. Well, our subject today is so you join the church. Why? And what happened after you joined the church? And since you joined the church, what is actually occurring in your life now? There are a few messages that if I had my way, if uh, I found out that I wasn't going to be around long, this would be one of them. Because I was one of the casualties of this whole mindset of joining the church. Most of the people that I know believe in Jesus, but they have no life that is the God kind of life to show for it. And I was one of them. And I want to be fair to uh, the churches within my community because the emphasis wasn't necessarily upon joining the church, but that's, that was how it was perceived. In other words, many of us, we ended up uh, joining the church or coming to Christ, uh, which is two different things, when Vacation Bible School came around. And if you can remember what Vacation Bible School used to be like, if you're my age, a little younger and older, we would gather for about a week and uh, we would be taught from the uh, Vacation Bible School annual. And it was lessons that were Bible-based. We, we learned about the different characters in the Holy Scriptures and especially Christ. Uh, what was really popular was the cookies and the juice or Kool-Aid. And children acted out as they did in school, and, uh, and some of them acted out at home. Um, a lot of us came forward uh, as a result of attending Vacation Bible School. I was one of them. And... Uh, I joined the church, but it did not benefit me uh, as far as me having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I did what others did. I joined the church. Now, once again, I want to be fair. Those who uh, preached to us and taught us and put an emphasis upon Christ. But for some reason, it looked like, once again, it, it kind of translated in our lives as to joining the church or joining the assembly. So in my case, I know that I had not given my life to Christ. But rather, my life looked like those who were in the church, those who assembled themselves together, who lived like they wanted to. And the only difference is that they came to church on Sunday and went through all of those motions. 
but as far as having a relationship with Lord Jesus Christ, those were far and few in between. And then there were those young people who perhaps did not uh, come forward as a result of Vacation Bible School, but they came forward uh, like many of us. We just got up and walked out and came down and went through those motions. But long story short, most of us, rather than repenting of our sins and trusting Christ, we pretty much join the crowd. Our lives look like the crowd. In other words, as we grew uh, older and became, uh, and I was uh, 14 when I came forward, um, I did things after I joined the church, as they said, that I hadn't done before. And, uh, and they were sinful things. So I know that I did not give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ because the difference between joining the church and being saved is that it's noticeable. You cannot hide Christ. You can't tuck him away. And when you give your life to Christ, the repentance and faith after responding to the gospel is that everyone in the house knows that you have given your life to Christ. That would be the same on the bus or going to school. And we didn't have those kind of experiences in our community. And there were those who made a, their boast about the Lord, but they parted like the rest of us. They were at some of the same old places that we were at on Friday and Saturday night. And I joined uh, and I came forward so that I could have bread and wine. That was the reason why I came forward. You know, I never told anyone uh, until recently, but that was the reason why I came forward in the meeting. So for those of you who you you joined the church, why did you join the church? Was it because of what was being taught, what was being preached, and you were brought under conviction, and you were told that you needed to repent of your sins and trust Christ? And since you joined the church, and you know why you joined it, what difference has it made in your life? And what difference is it making in your life right now? You know, most of the people that I know who came forward in a meeting, whether vacation Bible school or they walked the aisle, many of them, they're not nowhere to be found in the assembly in no neighborhood, no community. The residue that are, they're in some place where things are not done decently and in order. The same Bible in which taught us concerning Christ and the church in the Old Testament uh, patriarchs who gave uh, definition to uh, God's understanding of God's will, explain these things to us, they've morphed into something that looks like something in the world. So I asked a leader one night and we were outside of the building in which we met. And I said, imagine this place being filled with people, I mean, you know, old and young and a lot of children. Can you name one person that's in that assembly who has repented of their sins and trusted Christ? And they are on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. This leader could not name one person, not one person, but they'd all join the church. Join the church cannot save you. You must be born again. You must surrender your life to Christ in the new birth. Because if not, it'll be just business as usual. And your life will look like those in whom you went to church with. I taught new members class. Uh, actually, I taught Pastor Trey. Uh, when he was 10 and 11 and 12 in that age group. And I told those children because I had lived a horrible life prior to the Lord saving me. And my discipleship wasn't going well because 
and and it's on me. I can't. I'm not going to blame anyone. But I wasn't discipled, and my life looked like, you know, it, it looked like a, a lot of bad road. And I stood up one night and I told those young people, like I said, about the age of Pastor Trey now. I said, don't do the things that Mr. Dabney did in his life to bring ruin to his life. You are learning about the Lord. Repent. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and he'll save you. Don't you know that the majority of those children, that they went out and did the same exact thing I did? They went out and sowed the wild oats and live like they like it. But I tried to warn them. Well, beloved, this is supposed to take place in the home. We're supposed to learn about the Lord in the home. And going to the place of meeting would only further the education of those within the home. So for those of you that you know me, you know that uh, you know where I came from, you know my people, you know I could not have somehow come up with this on my own. Well, I want to see everyone saved, born into the kingdom of God. And not just mere church children. And not those who came through the system. Came through the, the institution. And I used to, and I was calling the, the, the church, the professed church. As I said last week, I'm not doing that anymore. Because the word church or the word, uh, it means called out ones. And I want to give the word church called out the same honor and respect that we give to the term the body of Christ and the household of faith. Now, as far as the synagogue of Satan goes, it is what it is, where the devil's children run the show. And you may have one or two folk who are actually saved who needs to get up out of there before that whole thing come down on them. But you know, I could not have come up with this so God had to be at work to warn those whom I know and know of, family and friends, that if you base in your eternity on the fact that you got up and walked the aisle and repeated what someone told you to say, what happened afterward? Because what matters just as much important as it was as to what you said and did is what you did afterward. And beloved, most of you, and most of you who know of me, you know nothing happened. You were like me at my baptism. When Dr. A.B. Smith baptized someone in front of me, he slipped. And the person went back down in the water again. When he come up, he come up cussing. We went in dry sinners and we came out wet sinners. Our life testified to that. Look at your own life for heaven's sake. And for those of you who thought that it was your responsibility to be in charge when it came to the church, you still went to the same places we did. When you went to school, you had, you committed fornication and adultery and you drank and you smoked and you partied. None of these things had anything to do with being in Christ. And beloved, this message is only for those, as Christ said, let he that had ears to hear, let him hear. This message will use in conjunction with what I've said, what you did when you joined the church, and how you lived your life. Listen, 
when you give your life to Christ and you sin, you're saddened by it. Your heart is broken. And therefore, you could never live in sin. You could never just shack up, commit fornication as a rule. You, you, you just can't do it. The new creation, which has no power in and of itself, is infused by the spirit of truth. And the spirit of truth would make you miserable like he made me. I had sin in my life after I was saved. And I was the most miserable person on the planet. Oh, I started off praising God, my hands up in the air. But it's almost as if my spirit said, put your hands down. Your hands are not clean and your heart is not pure. And I had to get right with God. And beloved, to be honest with you, right now, as I look at myself, there are times when I can't stand myself in Christ. This has nothing to do with him, but it has everything to do with how I fail him and how I choose. To step out on him. And to break his heart. Beloved, what we went to the church house for. We should have got it at home. We went up there for someone to teach us. Who was living this thing. This thing should have been lived before our eyes. It should have been modeled. In the very place in which we rose up. And in the same place in which we pillared our heads. My community knows so little about this. To the extent you see what our community and neighborhoods look like. So beloved, if you went up and mumbled some words behind the bishop or the, the pastor or the preacher, or whoever. But you never repented. You never trusted Christ. In other words, when you came forward, did you come as a sinner, desiring with everything within you to be saved, as though your life, your natural bone life, depended on it, even though it may not have, did you come out of desperation because you saw yourself in light of God's word? Or did you just come up like a group of kids one night at a vacation Bible school where I was there and they snickered the whole time in class? Some of them were rebellious. And then they came forward. And as I was leading them in prayer, I was looking at them. And some of them was just looking at one another and grinning and, and making those expressions on their faces. And those same children out living like the devil today. They living like I lived. Beloved, I'm, I'm no one. And I'm nothing. And when I came up here today, I said to myself, Dennis, you get to running with the word sometimes. Something that mama used to tell me not to do when I would go to the well and draw water. Yeah, I come from that piece of cloth. We didn't have indoor plumbing. We didn't have a phone. We had a well. But I'll tell you one thing. We had plenty of food and we had clean clothes. But when we, I would go to the well because I wanted to play ball. I would go there and draw a whole bucket of water. In time I get it to the house, it was about a half a bucket because I'd get it there and water would be sloshing all over me and all on the ground and on the grass. And then I had to go back and get some more. So for this message, I don't want to spill any water. I want to make sure that you get what God has for you. Now what you can do it's like what I'm doing in my natural life. I'm, I'm starting over again. There are those who are my age and younger who have retired. I, I'm not in a position to retire. And based on how good the Lord has been to me, 
I still have my health and strength and soundness of my mind. Beloved, I have to work. And therefore, my schedule has been turned upside down and inside out. But I want to be faithful to the ministry to which I believe the Lord Jesus has given me the great privilege of serving him as I minister to the church. I would much had rather had been down at the church at this time and to have a large crowd of people. No, that hasn't happened. We've only had just a few people to come out. We only have a few people in the church. And I thank the Lord for the few who are with us. And I'm grateful for that. But I feel like there are times when I wear them out because I'm going to preach like there's thousands and thousands upon thousands in the room. And that's just the way that I'm wired. But beloved, for heaven's sake, look at where you are. What difference did it make because you joined the church? Based on how you're living. What difference did it make? You were water baptized. You are living like the devil. Oh yes. You're giving in marriage. And you're eating. You're drinking. And you can just keep that going. You're fishing. You're hunting. Oh, you're doing all the things your little heart desire. But you were water baptized. And you joined the church. What difference did it make? Beloved, when you give your life to Christ. He becomes your life. There was someone who told me, they said, you know, we've been watching you because we figured that one day this would pass and you just come back to yourself. They said, no, you haven't. And it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with the goodness of God. And may I say to you, his long suffering for heaven's sake. Beloved, we have issues and problems too big for us to handle. And the greatest problem known to mankind is that of sin. Sin is unruly. Sin doesn't care who you are. You can be Jew or Gentile. Sin will take you down to the lowest pit. And there are those of you, and there are faces that are just coming before my spirit. Oh, I can see you praise dancing. Oh, I can see you with your head laid back. And right now you're in a place where you reject sound doctrine in favor of doing what you want to do you are in rebellion what did joining the church do for you beloved i want to help you so i truly believe that it was always god's plan and his purpose that his word be taught in the home i have some passages that i want to lift before you make a few comments and then I'm going to step aside. In Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. Noah has found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was found. That's the only way that you find grace. God finds you. And grace essentially means the Lord puts a bow in his back and he reaches down to man. And he reached down to this man. And he had this man to serve him. This man who received his grace, obeyed. His word. And listen to this in chapter 7 and verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thou house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Nor the preacher of righteousness also instructed his family in the way of righteousness. In Genesis chapter 18, we have Abraham. Abraham was chosen from amongst heathens, those who were pagans, 
listen to what the Lord had to say about this man. The Lord, along with the two men, the two angels, had appeared to Abraham at his tent. In verse 16, And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, because these angels had business there. They were going to go and rescue Lot. Noah's nephew. And they would bring out Noah's wife and daughters and their husbands. All who would be willing. They had business in Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. But what he says next to this man is paramount. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he have spoken of him. Abraham is going to teach his family the way of the Lord, much like Noah did. And they were blessed to be able to enter the ark with Noah. Because Noah preached to the world of his day. Noah preached. And his audience was his entire family. Since we all came from Adam. But that crowd was closer blood than what we are to Adam. Noah preached to his relatives. But you want to know something? They had ears. They had the gifts in which God had placed upon the side of their ears. But they didn't have ears to hear the word of God. Abraham, God said, you're going to be great. But it's going to start off because you're going to be great in your own home. You're going to teach your family. You're going to instruct your wife in the word of God. In Joshua chapter 24, Joshua has called all of Israel's elders together. And uh, heads of the people, the, the rulers and their officers. And he gave them a history lesson. And in a nutshell, he gave them the history from Abraham to Jacob, to Isaac, to Jacob, all who were on the other side of the Jordan. All the way to those who were on the promised land side of the Jordan. Listen to what he said here in verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And serve you the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your father served. That were on the other side of the flood. Or the gods of the Amorites in whom land ye dwell. But as for me and my house. 
we will serve the Lord. The Lord instructed Joshua to eat the book of the law, to consume it, to impart it, to instruct not only his people, but his own family in the things of the Lord. In Acts chapter 2, we have the church born from above, true believers in the Lord, and those who were, were uh, born into the kingdom of God, they were baptized. Listen at chapter 2, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word, and that's Peter's preaching, were baptized. In the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And notice what the church continued in. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. This occurred when the church assembled, but even when the church went to their several homes, this was what was continued to be taught from house to house. And then in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I overlook Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And beginning at verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whether ye go to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's sons, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Notice this. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way. And when thou liest down. And when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. And they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates God wanted his people to be taught the word of God continually Moses responsibility was to teach the fathers the fathers to teach the son the son and son son the word of God. The children would be taught along with their wives also. Look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Even 
in the church when it comes to children, but also husbands teaching their wives at the same time. Notice this. This is something that we don't practice anymore, but it's God's word and it's true. And it's supposed to be practiced. The context here, he's dealing with prophesying. And I know that there is some discussion about, well, a woman can prophesy in the church. We have no, we have no reference. We have no scripture of a woman prophesying in the general assembly where there were men present. Prophesying amongst other women, I, I'll, I'll give her that. But to prophesy, when you read that a woman ought to have her head covered when she's praying or prophesying, it has nothing to do with her being in the general assembly. Because Paul goes at length to mention when you come together. Several times. When you come together. When you come together. When you come together. So to say that there were women prophesying in the church when the whole church came together is erroneous. We do not have one incident with that showing. As a matter of fact, to the contrary, in the context is dealing with the prophets, those who were prophesying in the church. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints, that your women keep silent in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. Well, the husband is supposed to be qualified not only to teach the children what the apostles had been teaching and the doctrine that had been given in the home to children, but also to be able to instruct his wife. Let her ask her husband at home, for it is a shame for the woman to speak in the church. Now, as I close, So you join the church. Why? Did you join because someone else joined? Did you go forward because it was the thing to do? Okay. So you joined the church. What difference did it make in your life? How did you live your life after you went forward in a meeting? Did you surrender your life to Christ? Let's say you went forward 20 years ago. Are you living a holy, sanctified life? I'll be honest with you. And I'm not a prophet. But most of you, you know nothing about that. You live like you like it. You drink, you party, or you play music, and you sing. You preach. But you love everything that's happening in the world. You support every ungodly thing there is. You are a progressive liberal. You don't even need a Bible. What good did joining the church do you? I'm going to tell you what good it did. Absolutely no good. Because we turned out like the folk we joined. They drank their moonshine. They crept around. They fornicated. They committed adultery. Some of them were involved in witchcraft. Friday night, they were at the Big O. Sunday night, they were at Mr. Charlie Vaughn's. I was down there and I saw them. I saw them like they saw me. What good did it do us? And some of you right now, the woman you're living with is not your wife. You play in house, and therefore you go to that place and you play church. And everyone feels a little better about themselves because it's a place where you can feel good about yourself. It has nothing to do with holiness. It has nothing to do with righteousness. It has absolutely nothing to do with Christ of the Holy Scriptures. Those of you who have ears to hear, you're going to receive this message. And you can thank the Lord now. And you can thank me in eternity. You know, as Lane Casadante would say, the, our sportscaster here on Channel 6 News, 
when a baseball player would swing with everything he had and he missed the ball, he did not hit the ball, Lane Casadante would say, and you got nothing. When you joined that church, you got nothing. You got nothing. You have nothing to show for it. You living like you want to. But beloved, someone has to warn you. Someone has to love you enough. Your bishop won't tell you this. Because things are not done decently in an order in that place. Folk living in adultery. Know what God's word said. Folk shacking up. And don't want to pack up and, and leave these relationships. And now, homosexuality? That's the norm. My God, from the, from the White House? And, and we, the church has, has gravitated and, and raked all of this stuff in and said, oh, we celebrating all of this diverseness? You got to be kidding me. Is that what you got when you joined the church? Listen, when I joined Christ, I didn't get that. Let me tell you what I got when I joined Christ. He started correcting me. And every time that I would not comply, he took me out to the woodshed. He put me flat on my back. Somebody wanted to hear what I had to say. I had a young lady in the pulpit to sit down like an Indian when I came back to the church after I'd been in the hospital for 38 days because they were so sure I had a word from God. She sat down in the pulpit to listen at me preach. I don't know what she heard, but I didn't have some spurious word. All I had to, was the word of God. And I've been telling for what Christ said. And what the apostles gave. Nothing else. No more. That we're to live holy and sanctified lives. And that we will be persecuted. We will be hated. But you're not persecuted for Christ. You're not hated for Jesus Christ. Why? You joined the church. And that's all you have. Your life. Listen. Listen to your life. Your life is testifying. Look at that woman you with. Look at that man you with. Listen, I just found out who my father is. And I understand he had a reputation. I knew of my mom. Apples don't fall far from the tree. I lived my life. Do you know after I joined First Mount Olive Baptist Church that I fathered children out of wedlock? Oh, you, you saved though. Yeah, you saved, all right. Yeah, I'll say. I was just like everybody else was living. So did you join Christ? Because if you're his, your life ought to look like Christ. But if you join the church, your life will look like the crowd you join. Take it from me. I'm not trying to spill any water because like mama said, boy, don't you spill that water before you get here. You'll have to go back and listen to what I open with that. You're living in sin. And you can't see it. You're being judged on your feet. And we're all going to leave here. We're all being judged for something. I'd much rather be judged by Christ as a child, chastened, than to just be someone that I'm not. Because I joined the church. And you can go up there and sing and have a hallelujah good time while folk are busting hell wide open. Don't you know the whole time I was living in sin, no one came and presented the gospel to me? No one. No one evangelized me. Mm -mm. Nobody. Folk just looked at me like, like this is normal because this is what folk were doing now. Back in the day, folk didn't live open like that. The child was born in wedlock. It was concealed. Sometimes the, the young lady would they ship her out of town, ship her to a city, come back, next thing you know, she got the child in her arms. Didn't parade the child through the church. But joining the church, what you went to the church to get, you should have received at home. I know you didn't get it. So what do you do now? Where are you? If all you have is church membership, you're going to hell. Someone needs to let you know that. You see all of these road signs out there? You're dead in the head? No outlet? That's where you had it. 
Your life is testifying. Your life got enough sense to testify to you even if you won't believe it. You are living the life that you've chosen to live. I live like the devil. And I wish that I would have gotten started in Christ a lot better. But I made provisions for the flesh and I paid for it. That's why I say it didn't start off well in Christ. Things haven't gone well, not because of him, but because of me. That's why I have to finish well. Repent. Christ died for your sins. The Lord Jesus Christ. Let me present him to you. He's more than Mary's baby. He's God's son. He is your and my creator. He created everything for himself. But if that wasn't enough in the process of time, on the seventh day, he rested. But because of Adam's sin, he rose again from his lofty throne in my sanctified imagination, rolled up his sleeves and departed the hallowed halls of heaven, came down through 40 and two generations. He was born of a woman born under the law. He lived among men. Oh, and I mean he lived. He lived the life because no man had been born to die for that purpose. We die because of Adam's sin, but he was born to die. He was sent here to die for our sins. So he lived the life. He fulfilled all of God's purposes all the way down to the very end. I used to listen to a preacher come out of Florida. And he said that all Satan had to do was just hide the vinegar. Just make sure that there's no access to the vinegar. See, if Christ had not received the vinegar by way of the plant, he could not have been our savior. He said that Satan couldn't even hide or control the vinegar. And you won't serve someone like what he said that can't even control the vinegar to make sure there's no vinegar nowhere around? That's who you're serving. Oh, you married. You went through the church, so you've been remarried. You've been remarried three and four times because your pastor been married. All this kind of carrying on. Let me tell you something. No adulterer will inherit the kingdom of God. No fornicator, no liar, no drunkard. Listen, beloved. Where are you going to spend your eternity? It has everything to do with what you have allowed yourself to believe here in time. If you believe that you're saved because you joined the church, you went down front, you shook the preacher's hand, you went through a new members class. Let me tell you about new members class before I sign off. New members class for some was just uninvolved men. It was hard to get them there. They was always busy. I asked them, listen, tell me about your experience now that you're saved. Well, it's the same old, same old. How going to be the same old, same old? And you just come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Are you kidding me? My life has never been the same. It was as if I was just saved. Just saved. Born into the kingdom of God. I can count on one hand the funerals I've been to. And I open up the obituary and you did not hear these words. And he joined the church at an early age. Let me translate that. And he joined that crowd. And if he did not repent of his sins, if he did not trust Christ, he or she is in hell. No need of the preacher hallucinating, trying to find something good to say as far as going to put them in heaven. No, only Christ saves. Because the same one who lived the life, he also died to death. On his way there, he was crucified between two criminals. I'd say between you and me. 
between two criminals. Gave up the ghost, died to death, and on the third day, my Lord was raised from the dead. Send it back to his father. And he poised to come and to judge this old world in righteousness. He's your savior. He's the savior of the world and especially all who believe. You have a savior. Take your church membership and with all due respect, put it aside and listen as the Lord calls you to repent. You are a sinner and you need a savior to repent of your life of sin, your rebellion, your sin of rejecting Christ for so long. Because you've heard messages like this. You've heard it from me. But you still, you harden your old heart. You still gonna, you gonna see what the end gonna be. You, you don't, you don't said I done made up my mind. All right. You done made up your mind. Those who have ears to hear, you will repent and you will trust Christ and you will look back at your membership as really something that you do need to be in a local New Testament church, but one that's going to do things decently and in order for heaven's sake. Well, God is not the author of confusion. Well, no one has to apologize for what's in the word of God because of what they used to believe 50 years ago. And beloved, that's where much of my people are. Those who are nowhere near the place of meeting and those who go to a place where things are not according to the scriptures. Repent and believe the gospel. You'll be saved. And God will grant you his spirit. You will receive eternal life. And God will give you a new family. Because I'll be honest with you, the old family is going to look at you kind of strange. They not, may not want you around. You may find yourself, and you will find yourself being persecuted. You'll find yourself being hated by those who only have church membership. Those are so culturally refined. Those who are progressively leaning into the, the world and the system and all of those things that God is going to judge because all that is in the world is the love of the flesh the eyes and that's love the lust of the flesh I should say and of the eyes the pride of life repent beloved let me pray for you our father and strong God we thank you thank you Lord that you drew me out thank you for saving me thank you for sending Lady from Blackstone with the gospel in her heart, your word on her mind. Thank you for the women who prayed for me that I would be saved. And Lord, I thank you for those who will be saved as a result of this message. Lord, save the lost. Save those, Lord, who were like me, were in church but yet unchurched. I was an unbelieving believer. What an oxymoron, my God. Lord, you have mercy on me. I pray you grant them time. But time is of the essence, Lord. So I pray for that man, that woman. I pray for my family, my friends, and my loved ones, and my acquaintances. In Christ Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, beloved, hopefully we'll get back with another message out of Ephesians uh, chapter 5. Uh, we will get back there. Uh, and hopefully not that. Uh, not that long from now. Uh, be in prayer for us uh, as the Lord is continuing to uh, make known his ways to me. And the more I learn about him, uh, the, the less I will really want to have to do with Dennis, to be honest with you. Uh, so anyhow, beloved, until next time, be blessed.